Thank you, Orla, and thank you, Joe, for the invitation. On the day I was born, February the 5th, 1984, the story of Anne Lovett's death broke in the national press. Girl 15 dies after giving birth in a field was the headline on the front of the Sunday Tribune. Few realised it at the time, but it was the first sentence in a long, dark chapter that was about to be written on Ireland's treatment of women and girls in crisis pregnancy situations. A chapter which we, as a nation, collectively and decisively shut closed on May the 25th this year when we repealed the Eighth Amendment. I remember being about 10 or 11 and finding the yellowish front page of the Tribune in a box that my mother stored underneath her bed. And I can still recall the sense of loneliness that washed over me when I read about Anne's final hours. Loneliness for her solitary walk to that grotto in Granard. Loneliness for her discarded school bag, for her stillborn son and for her last few breaths. That this young girl could call on no one to sit beside her and hold her hand as she processed pain, fear, confusion and grief is an image that still jars with me to this day. Because that is not compassion and that is not care. It is an image that came back to me on February the 5th this year when I was contacted and asked would I be interested in working with the Together for Yes campaign. Exactly 34 years to the day that Anne's story broke in the national media, here was an opportunity to end the loneliness endured by tens of thousands of other women who, due to the Eighth Amendment, were deprived of care at home during their own crisis pregnancies. And so began my involvement with the incredible Together for Yes movement, formed by the amalgamation of three organisations, the Coalition to Repeal the Eighth Amendment, the National Women's Council and the Abortion Rights Campaign. The result was a grassroots, ground up, sophisticated civil society campaign consisting of thousands of volunteers and over 90 member organisations ranging from trade unions to student bodies to NGOs. We were focused, we were precise and we were completely female led. We were calm and reflective in our approach because we believed that that's what the Irish mood was. Ours was an evidence-led campaign. Every step we took, every action, every initiative was informed by the fact that we were listening at the door to and had access to research about what the people wanted and where the mood was at. And what Ireland wanted was a measured and informed debate that respected the sensitivities and the complexities at the heart of it. We were also apolitical. We united people of all political persuasions and none, because remember, this referendum was a once in a generation opportunity. So this time, it wasn't a matter of being left or right. It was simply a matter of right and wrong. We wanted to right the wrong that saw couples with a diagnosis of fatal fetal anomaly deprived of the right to choose to have a termination in their own home country. We wanted to right the wrong that sees thousands of women take abortion pills in their bedrooms and bathrooms without any medical support whatsoever, most of them mothers. We wanted to right the wrong, which means rape victims who become, excuse me, who become pregnant are forced to travel abroad for care. And we wanted to write a new chapter in Ireland's social history. A chapter which treated women in crisis pregnancies as equals and which recognised that abortion is a reality in Irish life, a reality that needed to be regulated and to be made safe. The issue of abortion has historically been something that few politicians in Ireland felt comfortable talking about. A country with many rural constituencies, with an overpowering influence of the church on the state, it was considered for a long time a no-go area for many politically, with Ivana Bacic and others, of course, being exceptions to this rule. Then Savita happened, and her case showed that public opinion was streets ahead of the political establishment. This shift in sentiment 
was also hugely helped by the tireless work of campaigners over 35 years, as Olivia mentioned, like Alva Smith. By the time the referendum was called, the opinion of many in Ireland had evolved to where they were in favour of some type of progressive change in the area of abortion, but they still had to be convinced on the merits of the details. This was evidence in numerous polls in the lead up to the referendum, which had shown a sizeable locked in majority in favour of repeal with around 20% undecided. In February, a behaviour and attitudes poll identified that one in five voters in favour of repeal were either undecided or opposed to the post-repeal legislative proposal. Behaviours and attitudes predicted that voters would be seeking clear direction on the post-repeal legislation and if such clarity was not forthcoming during the campaign, the referendum may well be lost, they said. So while public opinion had indeed moved, there was nothing to suggest that the result was a foregone conclusion. The challenge, therefore, for Together for Yes was to create a space and an environment in which all kinds of voices in Ireland would be comfortable discussing the Eighth Amendment and in asking the people of Ireland to vote yes. As communications manager, it was my job to use data from focus groups and polling research to build a coherent narrative around the campaign. And this had to be a narrative that would resonate with our target audience. Now, the golden rule in all communications, whether you are the local PRO for a GAA club or whether you are the spin doctor for Donald Trump, God love you, is to know your audience. Or audience was the aforementioned one in five soft yes voter. They were a key demographic essential to getting the vote uh, over the line and, and then some. They were warm to yes but they harboured worries and we knew that we had to take them on a journey to yes with us. But to get them there we, they, we knew they needed our respect and our reassurance. Respect for the fact that they held doubts and reassurance that voting yes was a compassionate and caring decision. We also had to speak to the large number of undeclared, undecided voters who, as in every election, can be the ultimate kingmakers. So within my team, we set about shaping this public discourse and debate in such a way that people would feel comfortable in discussing, comfortable rather than nervous, in discussing the, the, the eighth amendment. It meant introducing a range of communicative tools into the debate which people could use in discussions with friends, family members or work colleagues. Those tools ranged from various arguments, core messages, language, concepts, images, spokespersons or experts. And to be honest with you, when I started at the outset of this campaign, the one thing I did not expect was the overwhelming support from experts in the medical community. Obstetricians, midwives, nurses, GPs, uh, there were never any shortage of them offering uh, to help. So I used to literally put myself at the kitchen table or at the coffee table with the undecided soft yes or the undecided voter and ask myself, what tools do I need to equip them with in order to make them feel comfortable opening up a discussion about the Eighth Amendment with a friend or a family member, or indeed joining into a conversation that may be already underway. Language, for example, was crucial. We actively avoided militant or absolutist rhetoric or imagery. It was important not to dismiss the very genuine concerns of people who found themselves perhaps confronting this issue for the very first time. Instead, we chose to speak the language of modern Ireland. That, that is the language of tolerance, of acceptance and compassion. Creating this safe space had a broader impact too in terms of organic social media that we never expected. Our huge focus on putting personal stories in the media meant couples who silently endured the same experiences felt empowered to share their own stories online. These in turn influenced their friends and families. These were all true stories unlocked by the caring nature of the campaign where we managed to equip people with the language to discuss these issues amongst their friends and families. And one of the enduring memories uh, and most powerful moments for me throughout the course of the campaign was in the final few days, 
uh, a woman became known to us whose daughter had taken an abortion pill and she stepped forward and was willing to speak publicly uh, and risk everything with that about the uh, experience that she endured at home, having to nurse her daughter through days upon days of recovering from an abortion pill, travelling to the pharmacy, asking for heat packs, buying Nurofen, wanting, as every mother would do when their daughter is sick, to lift up the phone and call a GP, but her daughter wouldn't let her. The polling afterwards showed that these discussions with family and friends, either online or in kitchen tables, with work colleagues or people out socialising, were key. 39% of people polled immediately after the vote said that the discussion on social media or with family members and friends was the most influential factor for them. Developing credibility around the Together for Yes message was the starting goal for me as communications manager and I tested every potential idea that came across my desk through this filter. Without credibility, we risked getting lost in the usual fire and brimstone that swirls a referendum campaign. We were, after all, building an entirely new brand and we had a sh very short space of time in which to do that. We needed to be perceived as a credible voice by A, the audience at home, and by B, key opinion formers in the media. And I always liken tr strategic communications to playing a card game. You, are, you have a hand of cards in front of you and it's up to your own instinct and judgment to decide which card to play and when. Some cards being stronger than others depending on the particular circumstances. So, for example, as the campaign got underway, we made a very strategic decision to tackle the 12 weeks issue head on. The public had not had much of a chance to digest this as it moved through the Oireachtas. So we published two separate position papers fronted by top medical professionals in order to give voters the clarity that the evidence was telling us they needed. Media debates would also play a crucial role in developing credibility, with one in four voters eventually saying that they were most influenced by them. We quite deliberately led these with the experiences of countless doctors like Peter Boylan and medical professionals, professionals who made the case about how the eighth impacted on the care they could provide. This was a strategic move to help build credibility for, for the Together for Yes Voice with people at home and show them that those who worked in the caring medical professional had hugely bought into the argument that a yes vote was a vote for care. Another aspect of our strategy was to limit the disruptive effects of tactics from the other side on our own energies. Huge potential existed for us to be distracted by white noise, targeted misinformation and emotive attacks to throw us off course and to start a fire. I worked incredibly hard with my team to never let that situation turn into a tinderbox. When they wanted to discuss process, we stayed focused on the issues. And while it was inevitable that journalists would try and pull us into the he said, she said debate, we did everything we could not to feed that and we stayed firmly on our own pitch and played our own game. The result was a very wide-ranging conversation, probably the most thoughtful conversation we've ever had on not just a constitutional amendment, but on the actual legislative elements that fo would follow it. People on both sides of the debate have since acknowledged that the public voted on this with their eyes wide open. Such was the scale of the yes victory that it was clear a fundamental shift had happened in the Irish psyche. The vote showed that the tectonic plates of Ireland's social attitude had shifted. However, in the posthumous discussion that has followed the result, I am amused by claims from some observers that the campaign was one year ago or before it ever started. Such a charge does two things. It undermines the deep struggles of conscience that tens of thousands of people across Ireland experienced in the final few weeks of the campaign. People who voted yes, but who travelled along an arduous journey to, in their hearts and minds to get there. It takes for granted a little the, these difficult journeys and the delicacy of people's decision. It also ignores the hard evidence and facts of past campaigns. Historical precedents in Irish referenda shows that a narrowing of public opinion is inevitable in the final 10 days of the campaign. The Irish Times polling 10 days out showed that support for yes had slipped 
eight points from January, excluding undecideds, to 58%. Therefore, we had to regain momentum in the last 10 days and protect against a possible poor voter turnout. To say that it was one year ago dismisses the important interventions of people like Savita Halepanavar's father and of the impact the personal stories that came to light during the campaign. So moving forward, the questions we now face are, what are the takeaways from the referendum campaign that can insist, assist us in the transition towards a new phase of social change? And how do the yes and no sides live together under one roof? For me, the most obvious lesson is that civil participation in Irish politics is in an, in an extremely healthy state. But we need sophisticated, apolitical, civil society campaigners to step up now more than ever to help achieve social change. I'm particularly fond of Olivia's idea of a flying column of female leaders to attach themselves, themselves to single issue campaigns. The key achievement of the last two referenda has been the building of massive networks of a new generation of change makers. These younger voters are issues passionate and they're less likely to be drawn into formal party political structures. Civil campaigns, which tend to have a more informal structure, have a future role in continuing to develop, nurture, and mobilize this valuable new cohort of voters. Big social issues on the horizon, such as the need to tackle the gender pay gap, will need the campaign muscle of these networks, and we need strong civic leaders who can mount efficient, volunteer-based, volunteer-based campaigns to motivate them. Secondly, exercises in deliberative democracy, such as the Citizens' Assembly, must have a greater role in our political system in the future. Initially dismissed as a talking shop, the Assembly proved to be a crucial part of the referendum process by giving citizens a vital sense of ownership over the issue and in helping to educate the political establishment on various nuances and subtleties that may have otherwise been missed in the debate. And I must, uh, with all due respect, disagree with Cora's point that people uh, hadn't gone through a thorough debate. This was one of the most thoroughly debated issues uh, in recent, recent uh, decades. We basically uh, came back, uh, we were, the, our campaign was on the back end of a two-year political education process in many respects that involved the Joint Oireachtas Committee on the Eighth Amendment that involved the Citizens' Assembly. So I have to be honest and say that I disagree with the uh, approach that people didn't know what they were voting on and indeed um, no campaigners acknowledged as much in the, in the aftermath of the campaign themselves. So for a whole host of reasons, modern citizens simply now expect to have a greater say and, a, and control in political decisions that affect their everyday lives. But the reality of our political system is that it doesn't have the structures to respond to these needs. Making participative processes like the Citizens' Assembly staples of our democratic system is one way to help give people a greater input into those decisions. Finally, as we turn our minds to the upcoming implementation of legislation that will give effect to the result of the referendum, we must consider who speaks for the one third of people who voted no. Firstly, as I know too well, uh, and my battle scars will show that no campaigners are indeed very skilled at getting on air, uh, and as they are entitled to getting uh, heard on our national media. And they continue to have very vocal, high profile advocates uh, campaigning for them within the Oireachtas. The presence today also of platforms like Facebook and Twitter afford no, no voters an opportunity to continually express their views online, something that wasn't available to those on the losing side in the 1983 campaign. But the most important question is how do both yes and no sides now move forward in a way that is healing and that is constructive? The answer lies in the reason behind the Yes campaign's success, an unbending focus on tolerance, on compassion, and on understanding for the other side. A key element of our winning strategy is that we expended huge effort and energy in trying to view the campaign through the prism of those voters who struggled with the moral complexity of the question. We listened to them as much as we spoke to them. Among those we need to thank are the brave mothers, fathers and couples who told their stories, 
who moved hearts and changed minds, who changed the country's view, and given the scale of the victory, changed the country. It is humbling to think that Together for Yes created the space in which they could feel comfortable doing that. And this, I believe, will be the enduring legacy of the Together for Yes campaign, the manner in which we demystified the most historically divisive social issue of our generation and showed people that you don't have to be coarse and abrasive to win a difficult argument. You just have to be tolerant. In the end, as has been well documented, the entire undecided vote broke for yes. In their own sitting rooms and kitchens, thousands upon thousands of people decided that the yes campaign was the warmer home for their vote. Every reason was different, every story was individual, and every vote was carefully thought out. Many of these votes were silent, but as the beauty of democracy shows, together they built up to a resounding roar. Thank you.